are back with another episode of Room for Nuance. I'm Sean DeMars. And I'm Lig Duncan. And didn't we just do this? We did just do this. <laughs> we were at the cross conference in yes. January. Yes. And the reason why we're doing it again is because we thought we only had you for a very limited window. And then I foolishly failed to pick up on the social cues that said that we actually had much more time. So we let you go. And then I beat myself up for the next two days. Like, I can't believe I'd let Lig go when I didn't have to. And then I very kindly asked you, would you be willing to do round two? And you said, yes. So thank you, brother. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) Would you mind praying and opening us up? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to talk again. Thank you for the conversation that we had last time. And we pray that our conversation would be equally edifying and glorifying to you this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I think the first question is probably the most important question. Did we really go to the moon? (laughs) (laughs) I think we did. (laughs) Oh, good. Okay, we're off to a good start. No, uh, last time Luke was very kind. He was very gracious. He did not get on to me about the fact that we did not talk at all about the regulative principle mm. stuff. And that was the only thing he was like, please talk to Lig about the regulative principle mm. stuff. Your book on the regulative principle, the name of which is? Uh, your place, or just got your hobby worship. Yeah. The short book, the excerpt yeah. the big book. The big book is called? Give Praise to God. That's right. And it was um, it was edited by Phil Riken and Derek Thomas and yours truly. Yeah. And it was uh, a fest shrift a posthumous Peshrif in honor of James Montgomery Boyce. Mm. It's still available today, and it's a great book. There are lots of things in that book that I don't cover in the short book. The short book is essentially an edited version of my first two chapters, which just make a case for the regulative principle of worship. And that changed Luke's life. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Luke used to be a music guy at a big 3,000-member church where every Sunday it was a show and wow. lights and fog and wow. all that stuff. Read that book, send him on a trajectory, and completely changed his life. Uh, the regulative principle has changed my life, but I remember the regulative principle was one of those terms. It was kind of like Calvinism. The first time I heard that word, somebody said, are you a Calvinist? And I was like, shoot, I don't know. Like, mm. am I and should mm. I be? Is that bad? Is it good? And then I only ever heard that term used as a pejorative. Yeah. And then when I heard the regulative principle, I only ever heard it used as a pejorative. So can you do us a favor? Tell us what are some mischaracterizations of the regulative principle and then give us a good biblical definition for the regulative principle. A, a lot of people will identify the regulative principle with proscribing or disallowing things that they like. So, uh, so, for, for, so for instance, during the time of the worship wars, when the, when the main debate was traditional worship versus contemporary worship, yeah. very often people that wanted the church to utilize more contemporary forms would identify the regulative principle with a repressive instinct that's culturally bound, Mm -hmm. that keeps people from being able to be creative in the way that God made them to be. And so it was sort of pitched as a traditionalist thing Mm -hmm. over against this more biblical, liberated, Mm -hmm. free uh, sort of Christian expression of public worship. That, you know, when when you get to define the other side that way, you yeah. can easily define yourself into victory. The the And let me quickly say, the regulative principle is probably a relatively new term. Okay. Uh, it's probably a 19th century or so term okay. that came around to express something that had been around since the Protestant reformers in the 16th century. And in the 16th century, the Protestant reformers were especially thinking about the Roman Catholic Church and its practice of worship. So mm-hmm. way back in the 15. 15- 30s, when Calvin wrote his little pamphlet on the necessity of reforming the church, he identified the number one reason why we need a reformation is because of the idolatrous worship of the Roman Catholic Mm -hmm. Church. The way that the Roman Catholic Church was doing worship, Calvin argued, actually uh, forces all its members to engage in idolatry because the worship is not in accordance with God's word. And so Calvin was very concerned that we worship publicly in a way that is 
in accord with Scripture. And the regular principle uh, came to mean this, and you asked for a definition. Here it is. It is that our public worship must be warranted by Scripture. I'm guessing that word warranted is very particular. It is very particular. In other words, you don't have to have an express command for every discrete thing that you do in worship. But there has to be a biblical justification for it. Mm -hmm. And biblical justifications come in more than just direct commands. By way of implication. Correct. So good and necessary consequence. And so for many things, we do have direct commands. We're directly commanded by Paul, for instance, in 1 Timothy to read Mm -hmm. and to preach Mm -hmm. the Scripture in public worship. Uh, But what about taking an offering? Uh, what you know that we we can you know we can go through various things that are legitimate to do in public worship, where there is not an express command, but there is warrant in Scripture for us to do it. So in Corinthians, the Corinthians laid aside on the first day of the week right. in order to give to the needy Christians in yeah. Jerusalem, and so there's some things that you can learn by um, by. Uh, by way of emulating what the early Christians did where there is not a direct command. And so that's why the the regular principle is best defined not as worshiping only as the Bible directly commands, but worshiping according to the warrant of Scripture. That's what we're after. Let me get out ahead of a potential objection from someone listening to the way you've articulated the history of the development of the doctrine of the regulative mm. principle. That's a mouthful. Uh, when you say it's sort of rooted in the Reformation, someone might hear that and go, well, I, you know, Reformation here, there, whatever. Like, I want to know, is it biblical? What would you say to that? Uh, I would say absolutely. The regulative principle is trying to get us back to the way that worship was done in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And if if you look at public worship in the Old and the New Testament, mm-hmm. it all has the same basic components, whether there is a temple Mm-hmm. or whether there is a synagogue, mm-hmm. or whether the early church is just meeting in a we home are the temple. or yeah. in, in the open air somewhere, uh, biblical worship always has these components. And you can go all the way back to Exodus 24 to see this. The okay. very first public worship service in the Bible where the Bible is read Mm -hmm. is in Exodus chapter 24. Mm -hmm. Um, God gives Moses what is called the Book of the Covenant in Exodus 21 to 23. Moses writes it down, and then in Exodus 24, Moses reads that special revelation from God that has been written down. That's what Scripture is, Mm -hmm. written special revelation. He reads it to everybody out loud. And uh, that's the beginning of the public reading of Scripture in the worship of God's people in the Bible. From then on, whenever God's people meet, the Bible is read. Uh, And you find this in Ezra and Nehemiah. You Mm -hmm. find the Bible read Mm -hmm. and then expounded. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you get to the Psalms, you hear the scripture, good truth about God, sung to God yeah. in praise, in public worship. Then you have prayer. In fact, the earliest description of public worship in the book of Genesis is in terms of prayer. Then mm. men began to call out upon mm. the name of the Lord. What's mm-hmm. the name mm-hmm. of the uh, form of Anglican worship that is done on Sundays where the Lord's Supper is not administered. It's called morning prayer. Well, the the Anglicans get that language from Scripture because public prayer is such of the essence of public worship that sometimes you can actually refer to the whole act of public worship as prayer. So there you have the reading of the Bible, the preaching of the Bible, the singing of biblical truth. Mm -hmm. You have prayer. What what about the, the final element? the sacraments or the ordinances in the Baptist tradition. We'll take it. Thanks, Great, you know, brother. And, yeah. and the, by the way, both of those are good terms. You'll find both of those terms in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which was written mostly by Presbyterians and Anglicans and independents. Ordinances and sacraments are both good terms, as long as you define them well. Yeah. Um, we don't but, want to have the dripping down of grace view <laughs> of sacrament, right? <laughs> I won't go there right okay, now. Okay, all right, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, the... Um, in in the old covenant, you had Passover, 
and you had circumcision, both of which were signs of the promises of God to his people. In the new covenant, you have baptism and the Lord's Supper. And when God's people gather, at least occasionally, those signs of God's promises are administered. And uh, and that's a part of public worship. Uh, Augustine called them visible words. Mm -hmm. So sacraments actually illustrate a verbal promise of God mm -hmm. to his people. And so all five of those elements you will find Let's just do them, Sing the word, pray the word, uh, preach the word, read the word, and see the word. There you go. Okay. Uh, now, uh, talking about the regulative principle and, and the ordinances real, real quick, uh, do you believe in image, just yes or no, not a preacher's answer, a short answer, images in worship, yes or no? No. Okay. Except for, I think you would Baptism say... Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Amen. Exactly, exactly. Except for yeah. the God images that the Lord himself has prescribed. inspired drama in worship. Baptism That's right. and the Lord's Supper. The image yep. that he gives us is the only acceptable That's image. Right. We see one another when we sing, all That's of right. that stuff. Okay. Um, okay, so go going back to this idea of the word being fairly new, 19th century, so 1800s, right? Uh, the word inerrancy is similarly... Uh, it's it's newer, and people have tried to weaponize that fact. Mm -hmm. You know, the word inerrancy, you know, B.B. Warfield, the Princeton theologians, they invented that. But we know that Scripture itself speaks to its own inerrancy. Would you also say that not only can we see a pattern throughout Scripture of the regulative principle, but that Scripture itself commands the regulative principle? Uh, yes, I do. And that's the case that I try to make in that little book, okay. Does God Care How We Worship? And my premise is this. There are a lot of Bible-believing evangelicals out there who know that we need to worship God from the heart. That is, we, we don't need to fake worship God. We really need to worship God from the depth of our being, and therefore, worship needs to be sincere. It, it doesn't need to be uh, uh, faked. It doesn't need to be pretended. It needs to be something that's expressive of a reality that dominates the whole of our inner life expressed in our outward public worship. So they believe that worship needs to come from the heart, but they don't believe that God has said much about what we're to do outwardly when we're together. But the Bible is very concerned with how we worship because it ties together two issues. Um, Greg Beale wrote a book a number of years ago on idolatry in Scripture, and it's called We Become What We, what worship. we worship. So good. And it is a very important book. Uh, Ray Ortland has written on a very similar theme in his book. Uh, it's, it's a tough title, Whoredom. You know, where, you know, it's the picture of God's people going after idols, which is spiritual adultery, and it's a similar kind of theme. Um, but the, the point is this, what you worship, you become like what you worship. And this is an argument that goes all the way back to the prophets. And the prophets would say, you worship stone oh, yeah. and sticks and, and you'll become like that. You can't speak, can't see, can't move. You know, you'll become captive to your idols. But the Bible also makes it clear that you become like how you worship mm. because how you worship will determine who you worship. In other words, if worship is not a response to divine self-disclosure, uh, if it's not a response to God telling us how to worship him, we will end up worshiping a God made in our own image. And so worship has to be response to divine, special self-revelation. And that means it's got to be in accordance with Scripture or else we'll worship God wrongly. And then we'll end up worshiping the wrong God. We'll yeah. worship a God that's made according to our ideas, to the thoughts of our minds, as opposed to thinking God's thoughts after him as revealed in the word. Yeah. And so worship becomes really, really important. And another factor is this. Public worship, no matter how you do it, disciples people. Mm -hmm. The way you worship disciples people. So what I tell people is when I when I walk into the public worship in your church, no matter where it is, it, you know, it might be a burned down building, it might be a storefront somewhere, it might be a beautiful colonial space, wherever it is, it's my hope and prayer that it will be filled with scripture. Mm -hmm. 
that there will not be anywhere that you can turn in that public service of worship and not hear God's word being read to you, preached to you, prayed back to God, sung in praise to God, and and then visibly seen in the administration of baptism in the Lord's Supper. I, yeah. I, I When I was on sabbatical in 2009, I took my family to uh, an area mega church. And uh, when, when I walked out of the church, my, my daughter, who was I don't know, she was maybe 12, 13 years old. She said, Dad, never bring me here again. Uh, it was it was every caricature of a, of a mega church that you can imagine. Now, the pastor is a Bible-believing brother. I mean, I know him. He loves Scripture. He believes in the doctrines of grace. He preaches for, for the conversion of sinners. He wasn't there that day. The, the, preaching, the preaching loosely called that day was basically a Rotary Club talk. Oh, no. But... The best part of the public worship service was the administration of baptism. It was a Baptistic church, and during the baptism, not only did they get great brief testimonies of saving grace from the people who were being baptized, yeah. but the man who was administering the baptism explained the gospel. It was the only gospel I got in the public worship uh, that day. I want to see the gospel and scripture everywhere in public worship, not just in an incidental place stuck off in the corner. So we we want our public worship to be filled and formed by scripture. And um, that's vital because you disciple people that way. If the scripture is incidental to their discipleship, their discipleship will be stunted. If the scripture is essential and necessary to their discipleship, their discipleship will flourish. That's got to show in public worship. Because the word is the only thing that works, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, on a spectrum, you have the regulative principle over here for Protestants. You have the yeah. regulative principle over here. What's the name of the other principle on the other side? Well, there there have been other names yeah. that have been developed. Like people will call the Lutheran principle the normative, the normative principle, principle as That's opposed right. to the regular principle. And then yeah. the 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 Roman Catholic principle is that the Roman Church has the right and authority as it is the successor mm -hmm. of the apostles mm -hmm. and thus is invested with the authority of Peter, it may make rules that are not found in the Bible for its people to practice in public worship. So I don't even know what you call that, but those are, that's Bad. sort of the spectrum uh, that, you, yeah. that people will describe. So one of the things that I heard from Mark that I thought was helpful a number of years ago is he says, you know, we're regular principle guys, but the one thing we can appreciate about uh, the normative principle guys is that we're both really still on the same biblical spectrum of trying to go to God's word to figure out how we should worship his holy name. We disagree about how to do that, but at least we're both trying to do that. Whereas the Roman Catholics say, you know, scripture yeah, plus tradition, and that just puts us in different categories. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the reformers, a big part of... Have you read Ian Murray's yellow book? It's like a compilation of all these documents mm -hmm. from church history. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't remember what it's called, but... <laughs> it's like d documents of the Reformation yeah. or documents of the Reformed Confession. I can't I know, yeah. what, I know if, exactly if what you're If you're a halfway about. decent Googler, yeah. you can find yeah. it. Uh, I, I was struck by how much of their complaints were in somehow connect, some way connected to the regulative principle. You know, the Absolutely. vestment controversy, Correct. this, that, or the third. And I've also been struck recently, uh, one of our pastors talks a lot about how uh, whether it's smells and bells on biblical stuff over mm -hmm. here in Anglican churches or lights and laser shows over here, they're really doing the same thing. One they is are. just doing a highbrow version. One is doing kind of a Walmart version. Right. But neither one of those is appropriate according to the clear commands of Scripture. Right. Yeah. That's right. You, 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 again, um, there are things that can make worship feel holy, mm. whether it's a high mysticism mm -hmm. or whether it's sort of a consumer Disney-fied yes. mysticism yes. That, that, that give you the feeling that you're closer to God yeah. rather than appeal to what Scripture says makes you closer to God yeah. <laughs> or what Scripture says matures you in Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, it all of us are looking for some sort of silver bullet or a red pill that we can take yeah. that can get us closer to God. And the, 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 the mystic 
sort of Anglo-Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic, high traditionalist sort of thing, or whether it's the clowns and otters in the, you know, in the in the mega church. Honestly, scene. that would be pretty cool. And <laughs> and, uh, and 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 what we have to do is not listen to the siren sound of either of those things, but but say, I believe that the Spirit works through His Word, Amen. and it. I think that that's. That and pragmatism. I, I, I wrote the the introduction to Matt Merker's excellent little book on corporate worship, and in that I said one of the things that Matt highlighted to me as I read that manuscript was while one of the big things that we fight as evangelicals is simply the consumer mindset. Our people tend to view public worship services as customers view a service being provided to them by a business. Yeah. And they sort of pick and choose what they like because what's the rule? The customer is always right. And what happens is ministers will accede to that by saying, give them what they want. And when you adopt that consumer mindset, either as a worshiper going to church or as a minister, a pragmatist, I'm just gonna give them what they want, you've already given away the store. Yeah. Because God is the one who says, no, 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 I decide how you approach me. You do not decide how you approach me. I decide how you approach me. And public worship needs to, it needs to scream from the rooftops, you come only by Christ. That is the only way in, he is the temple. He is the one by whom you come to God. He is the sacrifice. He is the one, I, I love the, the, the phrase, that in, in public worship, God is the one who determines how we approach him, and he alone is the one who makes it possible. Mm. See, he, he not only says there's, it's only by Christ, he provides Christ, mm. and he says, come to me by Christ. And our public worship needs to say that loud and clear to our people. Wow, yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Uzzah. Because I think the the main takeaway, well, there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack. But one of the one of the main takeaways is that good intentions are not enough, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the ark from hitting the ground. I think Shy Lin in one of his songs says, "Uzza thought that his sinful hands were cleaner than the dirt." Mm. Uh, so I think a lot of times we give our brothers a pass on unbiblical worship because he's a good brother, his heart's in the right place. And that's not wrong. You want to be gracious. You want to be, yeah, you want to give people the benefit of the doubt. But at the end of the day, if God is the one who has made it possible, and if he is the one who has told us how we should approach him, there is a measure of, you better be careful here because you're leading God's people and you're proclaiming his name. And if you do it in a way that he hasn't prescribed, you're on shaky ground. You're in, you're in a dangerous place. Elaborate on that. Well, I only want to uh, amen to everything you just said. And one thing to add, when I look at that, the whole flow of that passage in 2 Samuel 5, 6, 7, you're getting ready for the ark to be moved to its final central location uh -huh. in Jerusalem next to the king's palace. And so it, it, it indicates that in Israel, God is going to rule. And if God is going to rule, he's going to rule by his word. And it is very clear to me that David knows why Uzzah was struck down. Because the next time after, after they are taking the ark in on the cart and it falls, David pouts for a while about it. And then the next time you see the ark coming into Jerusalem is coming in on poles. And remember, the king had to write down the law, his own copy of the law. So David knew the law. The law is the Levites carry it and they carry it on poles. The next time you see it, it's on pole. So David knows why Uzzah is struck down. It's no mystery to David. David had not insisted that it be done according to God's word. And disaster happened. And God has yeah. a reason for why he commands what he commands. And so the, the Puritans would say about that, I, I think it is true that God gives us all kinds of latitude and mercy that we don't deserve. That should never lead us to presumption, however. And there was presumption there, and, and I no, no question God meant to send David a message. Yeah. And the message is, if, if I'm really going to rule, 
this people, it's going to be my, by my word. And if the king won't pay attention to my word, yeah. who will? Wow. And so I, I think that whole scene is about God ruling his people by his word. And in the very central issue of worship, and the ark did what? It symbolized the special presence of God with his people. If you're not going to treat that with respect, what are you going to treat with respect? And just, I can't help but hear that story through the lens of being a pastor and just thinking, if I mess this up, people get hurt. This isn't a game. This is not theoretical. David's failure led to someone dying. Hopefully that doesn't happen at Sixth Avenue, even if we mess mm. up. <laughs> uh, it probably won't. Um, well, again, but, but, but again, as a pastor, you, you know you want to be careful with the Word of God. I remember as a youth director in St. Louis in the mid-1980s, teaching on a Wednesday night and looking at some of my students writing notes in the margins of their Bibles based on my little lesson that I was teaching that Wednesday night to high school age kids. And it struck me like thunder. I, I better be telling them what the Word of God is saying because they are writing notes. Yeah in the margins. of the, All of us as pastors ought to have that attitude. Yeah. I want to be careful yeah. what I do. These are God's people, yeah. and they're to be ruled by God's word, not by my goofy ideas. So I want everything I do to be in accordance with God's word. Wow. Also, trying to picture you as a youth guy. <laughs> I, really, I really was, Sean. Crazy I really haircut, was. ripped jeans. No, Never had a crazy that. haircut. <laughs> Always wore khakis. I was the most uncool <laughs> youth guy that ever existed. Yeah. But I had really re amazing kids. You were faithful. That's all that matters, brother. Um, let's talk a little bit about beauty in mm -hmm. relation to the regulative principle. Uh, I'll give you a little spiel, and then you help me make it better or correct me, okay? Yeah. So uh, we're thinking about the rebuild of our church, mm -hmm. and a lot of people in our congregation, surprise, surprise, have strong opinions about how we should do this out of the third, and our congregation is great. It's not, it's not a big deal. We're not going to split over the color of the mm -hmm. carpet. But we did want to say, okay, let's get ahead of this. Let's do some teaching. Even when it comes to the architecture of a church, we think that the Bible, although it doesn't give us an exact plan or layout for the building, right. has a lot to say. So here's the main thing that we said in relation to beauty. We said that beauty in the Sunday morning gathering is what the people are doing in worship. The building itself is merely there to accommodate this divinely prescribed beautiful thing that's taking place. And so Russell Berger, our assistant pastor, when he taught about it last Wednesday night, he said, our church building should be kind of like what a building like a doctor's office. It should be nice. It should be well-kept. It shouldn't be distracting or so ugly people don't want to go into it. But it should basically, once you walk in, you should forget about it so that you immediately mm -hmm. focus on that which you are mm -hmm. there to do mm -hmm. in a doctor's office. It would be your medical mm -hmm. stuff. In the church, it's worship. And so that's not to say that it's wrong to have a kind of beauty in your architecture, but the beauty in the architecture should not in any way be in competition with the beauty of the church. And in addition to that, the beauty should not be such that we feel like we are in any Roman Catholic sense being led into the right. presence of anything. Uh, yeah, so basically that's our spiel on it. Anything you would add to or take away from that? Well, that's that's a huge discussion deserving of, you know, an hour conversation. But here, here are a couple of thoughts. The minute that you build a building, that building sends messages whether you like it or not. And so what you need to be aware of are what are the unintended consequences of messages that you send. Now, I, I think that the, the rule for Protestant architecture has always been if public worship is centered around God's word, the architecture should facilitate yes. the communication of God's word. So Luther called the first Luther, Lutheran churches that were built in Germany. You know, many of the Lutheran churches in Germany had been Roman Catholic churches. Right. So when they Pulpit off to the side, correct. altar so in the front. So when they started to build Lutheran churches, he called them mouth houses. <laughs> that, that is... It the, probably the, sounds better in the German. The design of the architecture was made to help the communication of the word of God in the public worship, whereas many Catholic churches are built in such a way that it is almost impossible to hear the preaching of the word in those spaces. Um, when, when I came to First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, 
in 1996. The building that we were in had been built in 1952. The acoustics in that room were so good, it would seat about 750, that uh, the pastor could preach and everyone in the room could hear without any acoustical amplification. So the architecture had been designed to allow a person to raise his voice, not to a screaming level, but to raise his voice to a higher than normal conversational level and everybody in the room be able to hear it. So I I do think we need to think about acoustics. I, I do think that there should be a simple dignity to uh, to a Protestant church, um, and 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 so there are going to be degrees of beauty. You know, I, I think maybe the most beautiful interior room that I have seen anywhere in the world in a Protestant church is Independent Presbyterian Church in Savannah, Georgia. It is an absolutely beautiful room, but it is very, very simple. Mm-hmm. You know, it is not ornate. You don't go in and think, wow, this is over the top, but it is a simple, gorgeous um, s- space for public worship. Now, there will be other places that are far less attractive than that, but if they facilitate the ministry of the word in all of its aspects, reading, preaching, praying, singing, and singing is something you have to think about. Will the room help my congregation sing? So acoustics that keep the congregation from being able to hear itself Mm -hmm. will discourage congregational singing. So for instance, a man who was an engineer uh, became the pastor of a church in St. Louis many years before I was the pastor there uh, or on the pastoral staff there. And he wanted to deaden the room's acoustics. And so he actually painted over uh, a, a portion of the of the room that had been designed to make the acoustics more lively for singing. And uh, then after them, uh, there was modifications to the room that altered that effect where the room, room once again became a much better room for singing. And, and I said, don't let anybody know what we've just done because it, it, it turned that congregation into a great singing congregation because they could hear themselves. So I think you do need to think about those sorts of factors. You know, you will see these memes out on social media. You know, our, our Roman Catholic friends will post pictures of their building and then they'll show the, yeah. the picture of the evangelical church in a strip mall between yeah. the books a million and the and the coffee shop yeah. you know and yeah. ha 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 you right. know we build these beautiful places you know well th- th- there's a reason why evangelicals and why protestants have been more functional in their approach to church architecture it doesn't mean that we need to be indifferent to church architecture because again once you start building a place for yourself there are unintended consequences both good and bad Uh, that come along with whatever you do. There's no perfect way to build a building. There are always going to be some liabilities that come with that. We need to be aware of that. Uh, If you want to read on this, Hughes Old has, has written about Protestant architecture. There are people that have thought through the philosophy of Protestant architecture that would be good for all of us to read and think about. Wow. Thank you, brother. That was more than I could have uh, hoped and or expected. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about seminary stuff. You're the seminary guy. We didn't talk really much about it at all last time. What is your greatest encouragement at the moment regarding seminary education? We'll say in the United States. And then what is something on the horizon, or maybe that you're seeing right now, that you're discouraged or concerned yeah. about? Something that your listeners will be interested to know that is encouraging, and and, and given that we talked about complementarianism last time, worth mentioning, because complementarianism has been beat up pretty good, you know. Um, The only growing seminaries in North America are inerrantist, reformed-leaning, complementarian seminaries. So with all the blowback going out there on social media against all three of those things, from, from ex-evangelicals and deconstructionists and left-leaning, da-da-da, 
those are the only places growing in North America right now. You, the, 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 and those are accredited seminaries in, in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and th- that is a very encouraging thing. Now, something that ought to worry us is the number of men going into ministry, even in the evangelical world, is dropping who are going through seminary. And I, you know, we've wondered about that through the effects of the tensions of the last 12 years, through the pandemic, through the election of 2016, through all the pounding on men, you know, toxic masculinity and all this kind of, and, and you know, pastors are horrible hypocrites and terrible people. Don't be a pastor. You know, we've wondered, is, is that having an effect? Apparently so. There are fewer young men going to seminary uh, and and into the ministry through the root of seminary. Um, And I think in general, that's a bad thing. And if you look at a lot of the large evangelical seminaries, the majority of students are women. Hmm. And one of the fascinating things... Sorry, how much of a majority? I mean, sometimes it's huge. Sometimes it'll be 60% of the student body will be female. But of course, the interesting thing is, even in the egalitarian world, the the majority of 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 pastors are not women right. so you know if you right. take the PCUSA yeah. it's a it's a tiny proportion of lead pastors that are females right. even though you have a very large number of women studying in right. seminaries and so I, I i had a friend of mine who who taught at an undergraduate evangelical institution said it was very important to many of his women students that they be considered as um, as uh, potentially ordainable and potentially pastors, but they didn't want to go into the ministry. Mm. And um, so the dropping of men going to seminary, that's a problem we need to keep our eyes on. I'm very thankful God has been kind to us at RTS. 80% of our students are men. And the vast majority of those men are preparing for vocational ministry. And I, I want to see that fostered everywhere in the evangelical world. We need men that are ready to do the arduous but glorious work of the pastoral ministry. And that phrase comes from my friend Dan Doriani, who teaches at Covenant Seminary and is a is a, f- a fellow member of the, of the board of the Gospel Coalition. Dan feels like we've got to send a message to young men. Yes, the ministry is hard, but it's also glorious, and it's worth it. It's worth, it's worth the sacrifices. Yes, yeah. you're going to have people that come after you in ministry. Yes, you're going to have people that betray you in ministry. Yes, you're going to have your heart broken in ministry. Jesus is worth it, and his bride is worth it. And I, I want to prepare my students to believe what they believe with such conviction and such comprehensiveness that it gets down to the level of their DNA so that they can survive the next 30, 40, 50 years of ministry and not become cynical and not become bitter and not become apathetic. Uh, I, I, I want us to cross the finish line believing what we believe more than we started it. Uh, knowing that along the way, there are many dangers, toils, and snares. And um, so that's a, that's a concern I have, is I, I do see an erosion of men. Prepa- now, seminary is not the only way to, to prepare for ministry. Yeah. There are other ways, you know, histor- seminaries have been around for about 250 years, basically. Okay. Uh, before that, the formal process of education of ministers was often through universities, which had been started to prepare people for ministry. Like Harvard was started to prepare people for ministry in the congregational but church. What in about New before that? Let's go before Oxford, Cambridge. Yeah. Let's just say first 500 years of church history, trying to do the Second Timothy two, you know, yeah. pass on. Like, how were pastors trained and equipped? Schools for ministry opened up almost immediately in early careers. By by the second century, you have schools of preparation for for ministry. Clement in Alexandria had one of the most famous schools for the preparation of ministry in early Christianity. So formal processes of preparing ministers started early. By the way, formal processes of discipling 
uh, candidates for baptism developed yes. very early. Yes. Sometimes there would be two years yeah. of preparation before there would be a public baptism of yeah. a convert. And there were a lot of reasons for why that happened. But early Christians were really, really concerned to convey the content of the faith, yeah. to test the character of both members and ministers, and to prepare them for life and service. And so formal processes for educating ministers have go back, you know, 1900 years. Can, can, um, I, can I pause yeah. you on that baptism question? Yeah. And not, not to do yeah. what Mark All would good. do in this situation. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this. We're about to have some cases of church discipline at Sixth Avenue. And I think our membership process is pretty slow. I'm considering slowing it down even more, a la what you were talking about in the early church. One of the reasons why they did that is because they were having so many people come in the front door and then go right out the back door, leaving the church for the world. And they wanted to double, triple, you know, double, like really be sure, like, are, do we have good evidence that this person is actually regenerate? I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a question. Yeah. In light of the rapidly de-Christianizing culture that we live in, do you think it would be wiser for churches to slow down, even healthy churches that are slow, to slow down even more? I'm not saying we have to do a three-year thing like the early church did, but slow down even more on taking in new members to the church to really make sure that we're convinced that they're regenerate. That's a judgment call for local elders that I trust in a yeah. Bible-believing, well-taught, church uh, to, to make. But I will say this, we do have to be in the mode of continuous and never-ending discipleship of our congregations. And I've, you know, I've been at Capitol Hill Baptist Church enough to be in congregational meetings yeah. pretty regularly. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's clearly discipleship about what CHBC believes about men membership doesn't stop in the membership classes. It continues at every members meeting. It continues in every public worship service. And I think, again, this is where evangelical pastors who have adopted the, hey, whatever it takes to get people in the pews right. is what I'm gonna do. You have given away the store already when you've adopted that because we have to be in the mode of continuous discipleship into what it means to be a Christian, into what it means to be a fellow member, uh, in what it means to serve the brethren. Uh, we've got to constantly be new. So whether we, you know, if if you only have a six-week membership process, maybe think about expanding what's entailed in the membership process. But no matter what you do on the front end, you've got to keep doing that down the line. Because uh, especially with a congregational polity, your polity is only as good as the embrace of your membership of that polity. And, and by the way, Presbyterians believe this too. Polity disciples. Polity disciples you. And so, again, so many of our you know, friends that we know are in Christ and believe the gospel and pastor congregations who do not care about polity, You've just, by just by making that decision, you have decided to leave off a part of the discipleship of God's people because how we are and how we act together is a big part of the Christian life. Look at the New Testament. So much of sanctification in the New Testament is how we relate to one another, especially in the church. So you can't be sanctified without relating to people in the church in a certain way. That's what you're teaching in membership classes, and that's what we're trying to disciple people in in every members meeting, in every meeting of congregational worship, and in all the other special activities that we do to edify the people of God. So that is something for sure that we need to do in an ongoing way. That's good, brother. Um, more stuff on seminary, because you are the seminary guy. <laughs> uh, so many... Once faithful biblical pastoral training centers, colleges, whatever, uh, or theological uh, theological uh, Christian universities have gone the path of liberalism, what, I mean, if it can happen to Princeton, right, uh, it could happen to RTS. Yeah. So how, how do you keep measures in place to prevent yeah. that from happening? Uh, the first thing I want to acknowledge is only God can keep us. Uh, yeah. You know, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. So we 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 have to acknowledge every day, God keep us. Now, we have certain responsibilities uh, in that regard. And we know that the, the, the Lord uses those kinds of commitments and respons 
responsibilities to keep us kept. Yeah. Um, and by God's grace, 60 years later, RTS still believes exactly what we believed in 1966 when we first opened the doors. What processes have we put in place to try and check ourselves there? Um, one is the board of trustees of RTS is made up entirely of elders in local churches that are reformed, confessional, and inerrantist. And they have to sign the statement of faith that I have to sign and that all the professors have to sign every year. Every year we have to re-sign our statement of faith, um, which entails uh, that we hold to the authority, infallibility, inerrancy, sufficiency, clarity, inspiration of Scripture. Let's go. <laughs> and reform theology as it's expressed in the Westminster Standards. And every trustee has to sign that again every year. And th that's a very sobering thing when we pass that around and we sign it again. And we read it out loud at least once a year. Is that not traditional? Is is it usually you sign on the dotted very line often, when you get hired? Very often, you know, like I, I, I know it's Southern, the professors have to sign the abstract of principles when they become a tenured professor at Southern. And I'm not sure what is required of the trustees of, of Southern. But at many institutions, the trustees themselves are not necessarily invested in the theology of the institution. Very often institutions will use trustees as major donors. And we, we just think it's very important to have elders. That's like incentivizing compromise. It, 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 well, and let me say, capitalism and, and the need to finance theological education has been a source of real problems in higher theological education in America. The need to pay for what you're doing has led to a lot of compromise. we got to keep the doors open. Right. When instead it should be, <clears throat> let the doors close if they need to. Correct. Yeah. And that's and I've, I've told people, we, 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 we are accredited. And I've, I've said, if ever our accreditors were to require us to compromise our commitments to the sole final authority of Scripture, the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture, especially on controverted things like gender, marriage, and sexuality, or to compromise our commitment to reform theology, I'd just say, that's it. We're, we're ditching our accreditation. Now, I, might, I, I happily want to say our accreditors have been great with us. Our accreditors have never pressured us to compromise on those things. Interestingly now, you should know that in the, uh, the Association of Theological Schools, which is the largest accreditor of uh, seminaries in North America, the majority of students in ATS are in Bible-believing seminaries. And so ATS knows they can't sort of just throw muscle around against evangelical institutions. That's where most of their students are. And they've been actually great partners with us in theological education. But if I should ever have a government agency or an accreditor pressure me to compromise our commitments, I'm done. I'm out. We're gone. We're, you know, we, and again, I would rather RTS close our doors than not be faithful to what our, our founders committed us to with regard to the Bible and Reformed theology. So that helps us. We do require all of our professors to sign that same statement every year. And then all of our teaching we make public. I, I can remember being in seminary when a professor said, you cannot record my class. And I remember thinking, now that's kind of weird. Like, what are you afraid of? And so when, when I became a young seminary professor, uh, I, I said to my class, not only can you record my class, but if I say something that is inconsistent with the authority of Scripture or with the Reformed faith, I invite you to go back and tell your pastor and elders yeah. what I've done. Call me on the carpet. Hold me accountable because I'm not, I'm not Caesar in this classroom. I'm just a servant of the Word. And if I'm not faithful to what we've said publicly we believe, call me on the carpet about it. And so I, I, I want all of our professors to be accountable to the churches in that way. All of my professors are involved in the life of the local church. There's many of them are serving as pastors uh, in in local churches while they teach because I, I want my professors not to say, well, I remember 30 years ago when I was a pastor, this happened. I would rather them say, you know, last week as I was serving in the congregation, yeah. this happened. I, I want ministry to be fresh to them. Yes, they need to be experts in their fields, yeah. and they are. 
but they're pastors. Right. They're, you know, the best person to prepare a pastor for ministry is a pastor. And so they've got to have that academic expertise, but they've also have, have to have their pastoral chops. That helps you stay accountable too, because you're 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 serving in the churches, you're working in the same structures that your students are going to have to go into. You're accountable to those things. That really helps. The fact that we have a public statement of faith uh, that we adhered to that helps in many ways. None of those things by themselves can keep us faithful. You know, there it is true. There is a leftward drift, partly just because the the culture is toxic to true faith. Yeah. It's not helping you yeah. believe out there. But we do try to do things that keep us faithful, and then we depend upon the Lord to hold us. Two more things about seminary, and then we'll move on. Uh, number one, seminary, more like cemetery. Am I right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What would you say to a cynical young man who sees kind of, you know, the West collapsing and he just yeah. goes, you know, uh, institutions, who needs them? What, what, what would you say to him? Uh, one, I would say is this. Institutions are the vehicle that carry movements to the next generation. If, if you don't have institutions you're not going to carry but like, a movement they're going to the be compromised. The, the institution that you love today is going to be compromised tomorrow. Look what happened to Spurgeon's College. Yeah. Look what yeah. happened to Princeton. Yeah. Yeah, at, the, but churches are institutions. They're not only organisms, they are also institutions. That is, there's an organic life to a local congregation, but there is also an institutional aspect to a local congregation. So congregations are going to go liberal. You know, they're going to be wonderful congregations that flourished for 100 years and they're going to die. Yeah. Uh, but does that mean that they are not worth investing in? No, it doesn't mean that. They are very much worth investing in. And with without those kinds of institutions, you cannot carry on the work of uh, the Lord in the world. And so there are always going to be institutions. It's, uh, Al, Al Mohler likes to say, even anarchists have leaders, you know? <laughs> and so there are always going to be leaders yeah. and there are always going to be institutions. If you don't care about institutions, you have just decided that you are not going to have an impact on the future. Yeah. You're not going to have an impact now. You're not going to have an impact on the future. Do institutions go bad? Yes, they do. Sometimes they go so bad that they are not reclaimable, but sometimes they're very happy stories like Southern Seminary in Louisville or Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where Bible-believing people recaptured an institution and now are teaching truth. So sometimes institutions go bad and they're recaptured. Sometimes you just have to abandon them. I'm, I'm from a neck of the woods. The Southern Presbyterians lost our uh, our our you know conservative resurgence. Yeah. The Southern Baptists won their conservative resurgence. So we lost all of our institutions and we had to rebuild them. That's why there's an RTS. RTS was established because there was not a single Southern Presbyterian seminary that held to the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. All of the denominations, denominational seminaries had fallen prey to either liberalism or neo-orthodoxy. And RTS was started because of that. So RTS is an example of an institution that was started because institutions had failed and they were unreclaimable. Southern Seminary and Concordia Seminary are an example of seminaries that had drifted and were brought back by faithful men. Either way, institutions matter. Yeah. I was in the, in the car with Dave Russell, who's a pastor here in Charlotte. He's a yeah. nine marks guy. Yeah. And there was no camera around. There was nobody there. It was just he and I. And he was just riffing on his desire to fight for the SBC. Mm. And I thought that was convicting for me because I'm, I'm a part of ACME. I'm yeah. excited about that work. Uh, a lot of people who objected to it, they were like, ACME is going to go sideways just like so. Maybe. But he just said, you know, this is the world's largest evangelical denomination. Yeah. And I don't want to let that die easily. I want to that's fight right. for it. And I said, oh, that's that's the right attitude, I think. Amen. Okay, next and final question about seminary. Uh, <laughs> father me, counsel me, lead me. <laughs> uh, 37 years old, a pastor. You ready? Not only do I not have a seminary degree, PhD, 
or MDiv or anything else. I guess there's other things you can get or a four-year degree or two-year degree. I don't even have a high school diploma. Now, I'm pretty atypical, but like when most people were getting their high school diploma, I was selling drugs. When most people were going to college, I was carrying an M4 around Mosul, Iraq. And then life, God's providence just never really afforded me the opportunity. And now life with pastoring is so busy. I don't really want to do online classes. Mm. And I don't even know if I would have the time to do it. Uh, what would you say to a pastor who feels like, man, I really would have liked to gotten a seminary education, but it just doesn't seem like it's in the plan. What what should I yeah. do? How should I move forward? That's that's a tough question. And let me say the answer is not the same for everyone. Right. You know, people will often say, well, you know, Spurgeon didn't have education. Well, not everybody is Spurgeon. Uh, <laughs> uh, people will say, I, my friend John Blanchard, who's now with the Lord, did not have, I, in fact, when John would come into my office at First Prez, I would look up at the diplomas on my wall and I would kind of be embarrassed because John did not have the academic privileges that I had to go to a Bible-believing seminary and pursue PhD work. But John was a voracious reader and a prolific author uh, and a very effective communicator. So, you know, the answer is not the same for everybody, Sean. And it's in seminary is not the only, seminary has never been the only way that people were prepared uh, for ministry. But I think that it is very important for at least some pastors to go the the way, think of a Mark Dever. I think Mark Dever, who was a smart guy, who who didn't have to go to seminary in order to go into ministry, I think not only was he helped by going to seminary, by doing a THM, by doing a PhD, I think he was better equipped to lead a movement because of his formal theological education. Not everybody is Mark Dever. Not everybody has to do that. So I, I think you have to, I think everybody has to figure out what am I equipped to do? What would be most helpful in my service of God's people to do? Every minister is doing ongoing education. Even, right. even if you be. are preparing a sermon series on James, I'll bet you're reading some really good commentaries while you're preparing that, and you know what's happening? Not only are you being helped to prepare better sermons for your congregation, you're learning about the Bible. So it's one of the things I love about pastoral ministry. It forces you, if you do it right, to learn, to grow, to mature, to be equipped, to study. So I think in our day and age, Sean, there has never been a greater need for some kind of ongoing education for pastors, not just seminary or whatever it is preparing you to go in, but ongoing education. Conferences are a part of that. People make fun of conferences, but when you know things like the cross conference, things like T4G, things like the the, the various conferences that are put on by the Nine Marks Network or some of the Midwestern or Southeastern yeah. or whatever, that kind of ongoing pastoral education, I think has never been more important than now, partly because the education system uh, system itself is failing even people that did have advantages that you didn't have. Students that went through high school didn't learn how to read and write. Students went to college, partied for four years. And what happens is those students will get to a seminary. They don't know how to read, they don't know how to write, they don't know how to think, they don't know how to speak. And we end up remediating some of the things that they didn't get in in those earlier forms of education. But we don't have time in three years to fix all of that. You know, seminarians used to have to present a Latin thesis to get into seminary, to get into seminary. Seminarians used to, it was assumed that they already had Greek before they came to seminary. They were taught Hebrew in seminary, but it was assumed that they had Greek. Nobody assumes that anymore in our world. And that do you know in, Latin? Uh, I do, and I had to work in Latin. Wow. I, I started Latin in high school. Uh, interestingly, my son-in-law is a Latin teacher at the high school that I attended, and he was hired by the woman that taught me Latin uh, at Greenville High all those years ago. So I started Latin that's in high incredible. school, continued it in college, continued it in seminary. Uh, but I, that's there are not many of those folks around there, and I'm not saying that there need to be. I'm just saying that, all we can do now in seminary is help you over the course of three or four years to learn how to self-feed, you know, because we all need to continue to grow. We all need to learn. We all need to push ourselves because 
the more we know, the better we will be able to help God's people. I, I remember Sinclair Ferguson saying many years ago, if I had only known my Bible better, I would have been a better pastor. And I mm. thought, okay, if Sinclair Ferguson thinks he needs to know his Bible better, yeah, yeah. I need to know my Bible Amen, better. Brother. And so every pastor needs to know Bible better, theology better, church history better. Seminary is a very efficient way of getting at that. When you are in pastoral ministry, time is at a premium. Mm. So one thing I would say to this, I would say if you invited me to speak to your fellow elders and your congregation, what I would say is deliberately give Sean time away from his local pastoral responsibilities so that he can invest himself in ways of learning. They may be one-week intensive courses. They may be going to a conference. They may be going off and doing a seminar. Some form, and, and, then, and, and then I'll say this, it, that will come back to bless you because what he learns there, he will bring back to you. When I was a youth director again, what I was learning in seminary was coming out in my Sunday school lessons, in my discipleship, in my one-on-one, -on -one, in my small groups, I was sort of translating that down to the high school level. Yeah. That happens with all of us as ministers. What we learn, what impacts our hearts and lives, we cannot wait to share that yeah. with the people of God. Yeah. So the more the people of God let you feed on the word of God, yes. the more it's gonna bless them. All right, let's give some counsel to Luke. Luke, are we so good over there? Let's give some counsel to Luke. Luke is uh, something of a musical prodigy, Mozart level, I think. And uh, he's redoing old hymns, modernizing them, making them more <laughs> congregationally friendly for the church. And we've been talking recently about his desire to pursue some kind of education in yeah. hymnody or the history yeah. of hymnody. He's probably, as far as we can tell right now, not going to pursue a full theological education at seminary. Yeah. What would you recommend him? Just like find some really good subject matter expert, like maybe at one of your campuses, and take some classes from him on that? That's that's one way that you can go. Okay. I, interestingly, the wife of my academic dean has just finished a, it's either a PhD or a DMA at New Orleans Baptist Seminary in hymnody. Okay. Uh, and she she teaches music at a local university, and uh, and so she's been working on hymnody. I actually teach the hymnody course at RTS Jackson, so next time we, we teach it, I'll send you a note. We would love to have you come over. We'll probably do it in an intensive. And because we'll make time for him to get there. Most of my students know zero okay. about the history of hymnody. Uh, they haven't thought through the whole what 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 about congregational singing? What does it take to really do that well? So our hymnody course is designed to help in that process. So yes, there are good resources like that around that you can take advantage of. Great. You got that locked in, ready to go? Thankfully, it's on film. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if he's going to teach it and he'll let you come, oh, we're going to send you. Oh. Yeah, I might go too. <laughs> well, I, I don't know who will do stuff at the church, but we'll figure it out. Um, Who... I gotta stop saying um so much. I, sometimes I go back and I watch these videos and I just um, um, um. Okay, <laughs> let's leave that in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and there we go. <laughs> I and there we go. With an, uh, let's, let's have a little uh, <laughs> palate cleanser real quick. You'll appreciate this, Lig, I think. I found out the other day that ants, you know, like the insects, I found out that they're all females. Did you know that? I had no idea. Yeah, I'll prove it to you. If they were males, they'd be called uncles. Ouch. <laughs> so moving- Dad jokes. <laughs> I got them all day. <laughs> Honestly, it was really hard for me to get this far without doing one. So uh, slowly but surely, here we go. What you can, let's let's say, uh, I want to say most, but I know questions put in the form of, of a superlative aren't the easiest to answer. Top three th theologians- that you are most excited about in the new generation? I, I ask that because with the passing of Keller, MacArthur doesn't seem to be doing well. Sproul has gone to be with the Lord. And every time I think about it, I just go buy five copies of the holiness of God and give them away. You know, Piper's getting up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, who? if we were to do 
15 years from now, another T4G, who would you hope to be on the stage? Well, it's not always the best theologians that are on the stages of conferences, true, right? True, true. Uh, because very often the, the guys that are equipped to think and write at the highest level are not necessarily the best popular uh, communicators. And so, you know, just because I'm on the platform of a T4G doesn't mean I'm a great theologian. I, I view myself as a mediator or a translator of better, smarter thinkers uh, to, to pastors, especially. Which is huge. And, and I think that's an important role. I think Kevin DeYoung sees himself that way. I'm a translator. I read these guys that pastors don't have time to read, and then I try and digest and yeah. convey what I've gotten so that those pastors can use that material in yeah. practical ways in their life. In I've ministry. only gotten Turretin yeah. because of Kevin DeYoung. There you go. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, you know, so if you know, if we were around Turretin and Van Maastricht, might not be on the platform of of T4G, but they would certainly be informing. Yeah. I mean, th think of the impact of Burkhoff on Al Mohler. Mm -hmm. uh, Burkhoff had a huge Im reading Louis Burkhoff's systematic theology had a huge impact on the formation of Al Mohler's theology. So you've always got guys in the background that are shaping the yeah. more popular communicators, and hopefully they're good, solid guys yeah. in the background. And there are a bunch of really good, solid guys okay. out there. And uh, and so I, I'm not even sure I can name the best or the top three, but sure. let me, let me tell you from some about. In, in the neck of the woods who've been very helpful to me. Hopefully that we might get on even on Room yeah, for Yeah, you could get. Yeah. So uh, I'll mention a guy that I mentioned last time, Scott Swain, mm -hmm who is the president of Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando. He's a professor of systematic theology. Scott studied at Southeastern, then was a professor at Southwestern, and then he came over to the dark side and became a Presbyterian <laughs> and became uh, a professor at RTS Orlando and then the dean and then the president. Okay. Scott's work in the doctrine of God and in particular in the doctrine of Trinity has just been transformative yeah. to me. And so I would say to your listeners, read, get, pick up his short introduction to the yeah, Trinity, uh, it, but read everything that you can get your hands on by Scott. And then his colleague, who is the academic dean at Orlando, is Michael Allen. And both Mike and Scott are young, reformed theologians of, of the highest order that I learn from constantly. They they yeah. are they are at the top of their mm -hmm. game. They're incredibly, incredibly prolific. Mike is in the process of writing a four volume systematic theology oh. right now. Mm -hmm. So th these are these are younger guys who I am learning a lot from yeah. um, that I very much appreciate. Um, another young uh, theologian who is incredibly prolific is Matthew Barrett, who is at Midwestern Does he sleep? Uh, Baptist Seminary. I mean, that dude is just and pumping out. And he cranks books. it yeah. out. And, uh, you know, Matthew, again, is one of these younger theologians committed to what's now now being called in popular language classical, classical theism. theism. Yeah. But all it, all it is is historic, orthodox, um, biblical teaching on the doctrine of God. But he's he's an expert not only in theology, but in historical theology. He's written a book on the Reformation yeah. uh, recently. Matthew is very prolific and uh, very, very helpful. So those are three names yeah. that I would mention. I could mention a bunch of guys in the Baptist world right now, some of them out of the nine marks. Bobby yeah. Jameson, for instance, is another yes. guy who is doing really good mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. in terms of articulating a classical Christian doctrine of God and yeah. of Christ. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful when I look at this younger generation of theologians, they're teaching me. Uh, I'm trying to, oop, I need to say that better than I've uh -huh, said that in the uh -huh, past. Yeah. Uh, and and I see there's a, there's a whole wave of guys behind yeah. them. And that was not happening 30, 40 years ago. Huh. Who, who, do you, I know you probably read outside of reform circles. Uh, who would you say is the most influential non-reformed thinker like who's been most influential for you outside of the reformed world? Well, I, that's a really hard theologically. I'm, I must say, that though, though I have professors like 
again, Scott Swain and Mike Allen, who read a lot of theology outside of the Reformed tradition because they are trying to interact at the highest mm -hmm. level with the way that theology is being done in the academy and in the world today. I, I don't read nearly as much as mm -hmm. they read. I probably read Catholic authors, and and frankly, Benedict the the sixteenth, the the former pope, yeah. is one of the best traditional Catholic thinkers of the last hundred years. And so that, that's somebody that I read and think about and and try and interact with. You, you'll you'll love this story. A, a group of professors from the uh, theological seminary in Aix en Provence in France went to meet Pope Benedict before he was. Pope Benedict when he was just Cardinal Ratzinger. Yeah. And uh, as a gift, they brought him a copy of the English translation of Francis Turretin, the three-volume Institutes of Atlantic yeah. Theology. Cardinal Ratzinger turned around and pulled off of his shelf his Latin copy of Turretin, which he had completely read and marked up. So Ratzinger, and, and and by the way, you can see his hand in the Catholic Catechism, which he was he was the head honcho in the writing of the new Catholic Catechism. He is sneaky good in how he articulates things because okay. he knows Protestant theology. Mm -hmm. And so he can articulate error incredibly beautifully. Oh. And um, so I, you know, I that's an example of a person that I interact with, but I often am more interested in secular, non-Christian thinkers yeah. and enacting interacting with their thoughts. And people like Tom Holland, yeah. for instance, who Dominion. You know, from yeah, yeah, Dominion, you know, he's coming from sort of an atheistic worldview and he suddenly realizes, wow, all the things that I love really are yeah. rooted not in the classic Greco-Roman tradition, they're rooted in Christianity. Yeah. And so I'm going to think of myself as sort of a cultural Christian because that's the only way that I can justify mm -hmm. my the things that I care about. You yeah. know, so I, I love to read that kind of a guy as I think about reaching this sort of mm -hmm. a skeptical, mm -hmm. unbelieving world with the truth of Scripture and the gospel. Yeah. You know, uh, it's interesting you bring that up. Somebody that I've been reading recently is Abigail Schreier. She wrote Irreversible Damage. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm noticing as sort of Western civilization collapses on itself, the people who 20 years ago would have been very hostile to Christianity and to the Christian worldview right. are starting to realize, oh, no, things are going bad. Let's not give it all away. Right. And they're making a lot of common grace conclusions that— I am benefiting from yeah. as I'm reading their books. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, this is not intended to be clickbaity. <laughs> I just have to say that out front. I loathe, I loathe that kind of interview questions. It's not meant to be a gotcha question. When I go on Facebook and I say, I'm going to be interviewing Lig Duncan round two tomorrow. What should I ask about? We get a number of different things. But pretty consistently, people want to know about your last message at T4G mm. and how that was received. And, you know, now that you're so far removed from that. And then your endorsement of Woke Church by Eric Mason. I mean, that one is brought up a lot. Yeah. Uh, so you take those in whichever That's order right. you please. Uh, I, You know, I have not had many comments made to me about my last message at T4G. I, at T4G, the comments that I hear about or the message about Elijah, the Which, message girl, I can on listen numbers. To that sermon right now, it's so I, good. Uh, the the very first T four G when I spoke about preaching the gospel from the Old Testament. Those are the three messages over the however many years that we did T four G from two thousand six to two thousand twenty two that I hear most about. At, from the last T four G, I've had more people comment on my prayers because Mark asked me to go up and do some examples of praying scripture, and so I tried to do that two or three times during T four G as a way of encouraging pastors, and I've heard more people come in about the prayers, frankly, okay. than, than my last message. That was a very poignant, wonderful T4G. I loved that T4G, um, uh, and I remember more about what Sinclair Ferguson said, interviewing Sinclair and Alex, what Mark said, uh, walking off the stage the last time and then Matt Merker walking off the stage and then there's nobody up front. And I just thought that is 
Mark and I were talking about this after is so appropriate that there's none of us on the platform. There's only God. There's only the gospel. There's only Christ. That that was just so appropriate that no human beings were up there. It was just it was just left to the Lord. Uh, that was a beautiful way to end T4G. So I I don't know. Maybe okay. maybe you've heard something about the last sermon that I you have nothing want to, to mention. No. Um, with regard to woke church. Um, let me say, if people wonder why I wrote the forward to Woke Church, it, 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 this will not take you five minutes to do. Read Neil Shinvey's short review of Woke Church. Okay. It, it will take you less than five minutes. Go to Neil Shinvey's site. He is no fan it. of wokeness. He is no fan of wokeness. Yes. Read his review of Woke Church. You will know why I wrote the foreword to Woke Church when you read Neil Shinvey's foreword yeah. and, and, and a, a review. Now, let me let me just briefly explain because I love it when when people that I respect ask me those kinds of questions because I, I believe that I owe clarity to good faith questions even and especially from people who disagree with me. Yeah. So I want to paint the target on my back. I'm not trying to be shifty and avoid, you know, concerns. I, I want to answer concerns directly. So I love it when people ask me questions like that directly. Now, when neo-Confederates who are podcasting from their mother's spare bedroom want to call me woke because of that, Shots fired. <laughs> uh, you know, then I don't care yeah. what they say. Yeah. And frankly, they influence very, very few people. But I, I, I've had good questions about this. So let me, let me say, here's, here's the answer. I wanted to send a message that I thought guys in our theological neck of the woods who are inerrantist, who are unapologetically committed to reform theology, and who want to see the church shaped by scripture, not by the culture, need to understand sympathetically what a lot of our brothers and sisters from black uh, churches and uh, in evangelical spaces are experiencing through that cultural transition that we started going through yeah. in 2012. And Eric's book was the best one at that point to sort of Where's this coming from? What what's all the upset about? Why are people reacting the way they are to whether it's uh, Trayvon Martin or whether it's George Floyd or whatever? And I can't remember when that book came out. Did it come out in no 2019 point. or so, somewhere in yeah. there? <clears throat> it's trying to explain why did things blow up like this, mm -hmm. and the, the, the you know the 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 commendation is not you know i agree with everything sure. that eric says it's go listen to somebody who in good faith but believes the gospel believes the bible wants wants to love the church and serve the church and doesn't want to give up on evangelicalism listen to him trying to explain yeah, his, perspective. his perspective now i think since then there've been some even more helpful things written. Shy Lynn's New Reformation Very good. is maybe my favorite yeah. book on this. And Shy does a great job of explaining to you. And so what I was saying- You don't saying, have to agree with everything he exactly. says in that book. Yeah. So uh, at, at Isaac Adams has written, there's so many other you know good things that have been written on this. But what I'm saying to my guys is, guys, it would be helpful if you would be a little more knowledgeable and a little more sympathetic about what some of your brothers and sisters out there are going through right now. It might keep us together because I had already seen by 2015 bad faith actors trying to drive African Americans out of white evangelical spaces yeah. because they hated the gospel and the Bible, these bad faith actors did. And they were trying to drive. A unity no question had been building in the 2000s. And no then question. it got no shattered question. in the 20 teens. Yeah. I saw that happening. I wanted to send a message, guys, I think we need to be knowledgeable and we need to be sympathetic and we need to listen a little yeah. bit. And it, interestingly, that message landed more often than not. I, I remember being in line at a new student reception at RTS Orlando and a, a young African-American guy comes through the line and he says, Dr. Duncan, when I read your foreword to Eric Mason's Woke Church, I knew that RTS was a place 
where I could come and study yeah. and I would be nurtured and built up. He believes in the inerrancy of Scripture. He believes in Reformed theology. He's committed to the gospel. He wants to have a biblical church. And that was the message that yeah. he picked up. Yeah. That was what I was trying to send to one audience. Mm -hmm. And then to my guys, I wanted to say, let's just listen. Yeah. And if we disagree on the interpretation of some sociological data, that's it's yeah, okay. Not, it's not the, the end of the world. Not the end of the world. Uh, we have about 15 more minutes with you before we got to get you to this speaker's yeah. lunch. John Frame, uh, he's, he's coming under fire, particularly Matthew Barrett, who is on a little bit of a rampage at yeah. the moment. He, he posted a, a quote from Frame saying some, I think, unhelpful, if not dangerous stuff about the Trinity. Uh, and Matthew Barrett basically said, why does John Frame continue to get a pass? I'm only asking you about this because you are the president of RTS. I know that you know John. Yeah. Uh, I, I have greatly benefit, benefited yeah. from Frame's work over the years. Uh, help me think through this yeah. better. Uh, James Dolezal was on this years before Matthew ever okay. pu published anything on social media. You'll remember James uses the phrase theistic mutualism. He, he says, as opposed to this classical theism that we've been talking about, Evangelical theology in the 20th century, even in its most conservative quadrants, was dominated by what he calls theistic mutualism. And that is a tendency to give up on doctrines like divine simplicity, divine impassibility, uh, divine immutability in favor of not, not open theism, not that kind of thing. Because John Frame Not Greg critiques, Boyd level, yeah. Oh, yes, not Greg Boyd open theism, but... Um, softening mm -hmm. some of the historical Protestant commitments to those uh, uh, attributes mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of God. And it's not just John Frame. I studied under <gasps> Bob Raymond, Robert L. Raymond, R-E-Y-M-O-N-D, taught at Covenant Seminary and then at Knox Seminary. Dr. Raymond also uh, questioned things just like John Frame did. Now, I... I I knew that Dr. Raymond knew a lot more than I knew. I knew that he was a lot smarter than I was. But I also know, okay, I think I just want to be confessional on things. So when I listened to Dr. Raymond, I thought, I'm not sure what that means, but I'm going to stick with the confession. <laughs> and I would, I, would, I would just encourage everybody, stick with your confessions. Because when, when people come up with formulations that contradict fundamental areas like the doctrine of God or the Trinity. Um, maybe we don't need to immediately call them heretics, but we also don't need to immediately adopt their ideas. It's, it's what I tell, I had a lot of students that got all excited about N.T. Wright in the, in the late 90s. And I said, wait around 100 years and we'll see how much of N.T. Wright's thought is yeah. still out there. And um, so a lot of theologians, it's not just John Frame, it's Bob Raymond, who I loved and studied under. It's my beloved Donald McLeod that I studied uh, with in Scotland. It's Wayne Grudem, a dear friend of mine. I can go down a list of guys that made, that, that in, in their articulations of especially the Christian doctrine of God, they made moves that were different from the classic Protestant scholastic formulation of the doctrine of God. And we're living in the heyday of the resurrection of the pra yeah. classic Protestant scholastic yeah. doctrine of God. So I would say, read John Frame with appreciation, but care on those points. Watch, watch what Matthew is drawing attention to. Matthew's right. Matthew's right about what he's articulating. Doesn't mean you have to throw away all your John Frame books. Right. And just watch out in those yeah. areas Go with where the confessions are on those issues. If you could be stuck on a desert island for the rest of your life, you can only have one volume, not volume, set, if you will, of systematic theology. What are you taking with you? Mm. That's really, really hard. But I might pick Petrus Van Maastricht. Um, it's uh, Van Maastricht. You remember Jonathan Edwards said, that Van Maastricht was the best uninspired book ever written. I did not know that. Uh, and so Edwards loved Petrus Van Maastricht. And that set is being translated into English by 
an RTS graduate nice. who now teaches at Westminster Seminary. It being it's trans, being translated from Latin okay. into English. It's never been in English before. And uh, he's gotten four of the seven volumes out. Wow. And I think they've got the last three translated now, but it's going through the editorial process. So yeah. within a matter of a couple of years, we'll have all seven volumes of Van Maastricht. And I think that might be what I took with me. So Bob Inc. is about to be old news. No, I love Bob Inc. And Bob Inc. is the hot thing right now. Is, okay. Yeah. And so again, th there's a lot that you can learn from Bob Inc. Because Bob Inc. is trying to figure out how to convey Van Maastricht's theology in a pluralistic world. So Bavink is helping you figure out how to translate historic reform theology yeah. in a modern pluralistic society. So I love Bavink for that reason. That's what Gray Sutanto and James Eglinton and Corey Brock and others are trying to do. They're trying to show us how Bavink helps us preach the old, old faith, the, 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 the scriptures, the gospel, the historic reform faith, in this modern skeptical culture because yeah. Bavink helped yeah. uh, us do that. So Bavink would be a great choice as well. You can only have one work of fiction with you on the desert island. Mm. What do you take? Can I have all the works of Tolkien? Yeah. Okay, I want all the works of Tolkien. So if I had to ask Tolkien versus Lewis... It Tolkien, hands down. No, okay, but not it's not Narnia versus Lord of the Rings. It's all of the it's works of Tolkien, of Tolkien versus, versus all the works of Lewis. Yeah. And you're still taking Tolkien. Absolutely. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you sure the government wasn't involved in 9-11? <laughs> the government was involved in responding to 9-11. <laughs> okay. All right. Rapid fire questions. Uh, tea or coffee? Coffee. Black, strong. Black, strong. Like, Amen. Like if I call it, it gets up and walks to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you could only listen listen to the preaching of one of these men for the rest of your life on a desert island, mm -hmm. Kevin DeYoung, Dever, Piper, Sinclair Ferguson, Keller, Sproul, or John MacArthur. Oh, that is so mean. Yeah. That's like that. <laughs> that is so mean. It's like Dever and Ferguson neck and neck. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the most slept on, which, do you know what that means? Okay. Most slept on work of theology. Like, like people aren't reading this and they should be reading this. Why is nobody reading this? Oh, wow. Oh, that's a, that's a really, really good question. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give a really good answer to that. Um, I, I will say this when, when I was, um, at Edinburgh, uh, I sat Which in, is in on theology classes with Donald McLeod, and one day Donald said, B.B. Um, Warfield outread, outthought, and outwrote every man of his generation, mm. and we didn't listen to him. Mm. So I, I do think Warfield is incredibly helpful on so many yeah. things today, especially, of course, on the doctrine of Scripture. Yeah but also on, on Calvinism and, and Reformed yeah. theology. And Warfield really anticipated uh, Bartianism by about 25 years and answered it before Bart had ever written it. And um, so Warfield is somebody that I think people, and PNR, by the way, is in the process of, of, of releasing some new editions of Warfield's works. And so Warfield is, is not easy to read. Okay. So you, if you read Warfield, get ready to take your time. It's not going to be easy to read, but boy, what a great thinker. What hymn do you want to be sung at your funeral? Oh, probably, can I say more than one? Yeah, of course. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Great is thy faithfulness. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. Mm, that's good, brother. Uh, mountains or beach? Mountains. Champagne or wine? Champagne. Whiskey or bourbon? Are those the same thing? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm not either. much of I'm not much Me of a neither. drinker, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Android or iPhone? iPhone. Uh, macaroni salad or potato salad? <laughs> oh, that's hard. Coleslaw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, night out or night in? Night in. Uh, what's your middle name? Ligon. My my okay. first name is Jennings. 
My middle name is Ligon. My last name is Duncan. Like I'm the third. William Jennings Bryant? Yeah, like, okay. well, it's actually, I'm named after a circuit-riding Methodist minister. Uh, my um, great-grandparents were in a congregation that on one Sunday would be Presbyterian, the next Sunday it would be Methodist, <laughs> the next Sunday it would be Baptist, and they would just wow. rotate through. Wow. And apparently a circuit-riding Methodist minister whose name was Jennings Ligon had a profound effect on them, and they named their third son after that minister. Yeah. And that name has been passed down. Uh, now my son is Jennings Ligon Duncan the fourth, and he goes by Jennings. That's pretty cool. Are we close enough now that I can just call you Jennings? You can call me. Any, you know, very, very few people. Dever would call me Jennings from time to time. Uh, I had an elder at the church in Jackson who would call me Jennings. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you can call me whatever you want to call Thanks, me, Sean. Yeah. Uh, I needed that. <laughs> Concert or sporting event? Ooh. If it were... A concert with the original band of Earth, Wind, and Fire, it would be concert. But you're if, blowing my mind right now. You're an Earth, Wind, and oh Fire. Oh, my guy? heavens, yes. I was a DJ in high school. <laughs> So oh, wait a uh, second. Yeah. Wait a second. Yeah. We got to go another hour. <laughs> no, okay. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, and uh, but I love college football. So okay. if I had you know college football, I just love are you it. Yeah. Mississippi State or Clemson? I, I put in South Carolina. You either pull for Clemson or South Carolina. Okay. And so my family was a Clemson family, even though I went to Furman. Okay. And so I I, I know some coaches on the staff. I know a lot of the people around the program, and I still go to Clemson games from time to time. Okay. Yep. Uh, morning person or night owl? Uh, used to be a night owl. Now I'm a morning person. Mm. Burger King or McDonald's? Let's throw in Wendy's too. Let's get let's get crazy. If it were Burger King and McDonald's, I'd pick McDonald's. Just classic Americana? I, my order at McDonald's is a double hamburger, add mac sauce, and a small order of fries. Wow. That's my order at McDonald's. I didn't McDonald's. even know you could do that. Yeah. Let's get crazy, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, burgers or barbecue? Oh, that's so hard. Depends on the barbecue. Texas, let's we'll say t Texas barbecue. Well, it's, if 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 you go to Four Rivers Smokehouse in the Orlando area, okay. you can get Texas brisket because that's where John Rivers learned how to do his brisket. Okay, and some of the best barbecue you can imagine. I typically I'm a South Carolina mustard based yeah, barbecue right. guy, but I love Four Rivers. Barbecue in the Orlando area. So you you'd take barbecue over burger. It's hard That's because tough. I love burgers. I mean, Man. I live on burgers, Sean. A good I burger. love burgers. Yeah, I had a burger last night. So <laughs> we did too, yeah. and it was amazing. Uh, French fries or onion rings? Again, if it's if it's the right kind of if it's the onion rings from Roosters in Jackson, okay. I'll go with the onion rings. <laughs> okay, but uh, I love fries as well. Uh, Chinese takeout, and not the good kind. I'm talking about the bad, bad kind. Like, bad you know Chinese you're going to regret out, it. Right, yeah. or, or sushi. Chinese takeout. There yeah. we go. There we go. <laughs> a man of the people, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, cold or hot? Cold. Rock or rap? <laughs> That's hard, too, but rock. Yeah. Okay. Did you ever come to appreciate any of, like, the like the lyrical theology Christian rap? Oh, yeah. 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 I And, and, and through... Um, a, a dear friend of mine who's actually now the the head of uh, Mission Mississippi, uh, Brian Crawford. Brian came from a, a background where he had been sort of part of a Pentecostal health and wealth yeah. healing kind of thing. His He went to Mississippi State. While he was at Mississippi State, his younger sister, whom he adored, contracted a very vir virulent strand of MS and died. He and his dad took her around to healing crusades. She never got healed. The, the, the theologians in that movement declared it was because she didn't have enough faith. Right. Brian <sighs> knew that she trusted in Christ. Yeah. She had a beautiful testimony all the way to death. So he rejected the theology of his youth, but he didn't reject Christ or Amen. Christianity. And he came across Reformed theology from John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, and John Piper in the rap lyrics yep. of this music that a friend gave to him. That's how I found out and, about him. Um, yeah. And so... Um, you know that so that he really introduced me to that whole world. I knew a little about mm -hmm. it. You know, I had I w I was a DJ when rap first went top forty. Okay. So Sugar Hill Gang, Run Rappers DMC, Delight yeah, okay. is the first 
group that goes top 40 yeah. with rap. The rap world, of course, had been around for a long time. It just hadn't broke yeah. surface into pop culture. And so I knew that stuff because I was a DJ and I liked a lot of it, but it's so crude, right? Yeah, right. So much of the lyrical content you just can't listen to right. as a Christian and say, yeah, that's okay. Right. So the discovering this other world was, whoa, you know, and then yeah. the ability of some of these folks to articulate profound truths mm -hmm. of theology mm -hmm. in ways that get into your head and you can never forget that's it. That's right. Oh, my heavens, it's so good. So, yeah, that's, uh, but I, yeah, that, yeah, that's my quick answer to that question. Last one. Classical or jazz? That I mean, I love jazz, okay. but I also love classical. I couldn't give either of them up. Really? Okay. Yeah. I feel like jazz is the kind of music that people pretend to like because you have to, no. but you actually and, and like look, it. And look, you know, I, I am not... Uh, my my younger brother John is a much better musician than me. My mother was a professional musician. Um, I I I know I can sing, but I'm really not. I, I took piano for a while. I played bass for a while. I've done some things instrumentally, but I'm not a, a musician. Nor am I a musician like my son. My son can play 15 different instruments and. Wow loves all kinds. He loves a lot of prog rock stuff because of the complexity. And and by the way, the jazz roots to a lot of what prog rock does. Um, but um, I I did a lot of sacred choral singing as a as a young man. And so I love sacred choral music, but I also love the the great classics. And I love I was introduced to a more pop jazz. So I'm thinking of people like Bob James. Dave Grusin, um, you know that that Earl Clue, uh, George Benson, you know, sort of th that kind of pop jazz drew me into yeah. the jazz world. Now, J.I. Packer really knew jazz. You know, he knew real jazz music. I didn't know jazz at its roots. I was drawn in from sort of pop jazz and then appropriated, you know, bits and pieces here and there. Yeah. Last last question. Favorite movie. That is so hard. Um, that is really, really hard. Um, I might say favorite movie. It might be um, as as bad as it is when you go back and look at it. Okay. The first Star Wars movie. Hey, I get um, it. I get it. You know, it just it, yeah. it, that had such an impact. I, I don't know how old I was. I don't know, maybe 14 or 15 years old, but I had never seen anything like that in my life. The visual Truly effects, groundbreaking. you yeah. know, which which look cheesy now. Yeah. The acting horrible. Um, the the script writing stilted, but totally took me into a, a yeah. whole new world, you know. And yeah. so that that movie had a huge That's impact a great on answer, me. Yeah. Brother. Uh, thank you for your time. We're going to get you out of here. I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you so much for our brother, Lig. Thank you for providentially leading him to the place that you've led him to today where he is able to influence so many people for the sake of the gospel. We pray that you will protect him and keep him, that your face will always be shining upon him, Lord. Uh, help him to love you and your son, Jesus, more than anything else in the world. And then as an outflow of that, let his ministry bear much eternal fruit to the glory of your name. We pray that this episode will do that to some small degree. Uh, God, all we want to do really is be faithful with what you've given us when you've given it to us. And we know that the promise is that you will empower us to do that by your Holy Spirit. So with hearts full of great hope and thanksgiving, we say amen. Amen. Let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that, if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would, without one quiver of hesitation, lay it on the altar to Christ, that he might use it as before in similar ministries of love, especially 
amongst those who have never yet heard the name of Jesus. At Ten of Those, we want to serve the local church by equipping your church family with great resources that are going to point them to Jesus. So we'll come and set up a pop-up bookstore in your church. There's no charge. We'll come for your Sunday services. Maybe you've got a, a weekend retreat or a conference. We would love to come and then make recommendations. This is one I've read three times now. It's called Incomparable by Andrew Wilson. And he goes through 60 characteristics of God. It just wonderfully takes our eyes off, off the world, off ourselves, and puts them on our Saviour. Now we've got lots of things for families and, uh, and kids. For parents, I want to recommend this series. This one is Raising Kids in a Screen-Saturated World. Our passion is to get good books that hold to the Bible, read by as many people as possible. We handpick our bookstore, it's curated, so we know everything we sell will point to the Lord Jesus. Everything's discounted. And as we make recommendations, we're seeking to serve your church family so that they may be excited and equipped to read good books. And as they do, we'll be praying that it might just change their life.